my my mentor says that it has to converge, right? <laughs> That's what he says to me. So when you are working with a say yes, um, uh, an engineer that is uh, that is senior that has more experience on um, QA, and you tell him it's not converging. It's not converging. I have <laughs> I have from five meshes at it, and it's not converging. And then he, he says to you, it has to converge. Welcome to a new episode of the Engineer Mind podcast. I'm your host, Joseph, and on this podcast, I'm talking to researchers, scientists, and engineers and how their work is shaping the world around us. For this episode, I'm very excited to talk to an old colleague and friend, Guillermo Giraldo. He is an FAA engineer with focus on industrial applications such as structures, process equipment, piping, and products. Guillermo is experienced in nonlinear simulations, thermo, dynamics, and fracture mechanics and currently works as a consultant and customer support at SimScale. In this podcast, we talk about how to divide and conquer a complex task in FEA. We talk about different FEA tools, post-processing strategies and sanity checking, mesh independent studies and what to do if there's no convergence. We also cover his job at SimScale, fracture mechanics, crack propagation mechanisms, scripting in FEA, and a lot more. If you would like to support the channel, make sure you give this episode a like and leave a comment down below to make sure the ominous algorithm is suggesting the video to more people. Subscribe if you haven't already. And now, ladies and gentlemen, enjoy my podcast with Guillermo Giraldo. Cool. All right. Guillermo, an old colleague, welcome to my show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great to see you finally after such a long time. Um, hope you're doing great. And today we want to talk about FEA and fracture mechanics. And there's a lot of of stuff going around fracture mechanics. How do you actually implement it? How do you interpret the results? Extended finite element method, all these kind of fancy buzzwords that we always hear about. Um, but before I jump into the nitty gritty, Guillermo, can you give us like a one or two minute bio? Who is Guillermo and what do you actually do? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm an engineer, <laughs> right? Um, I actually studied uh, mechatronics at the university. Uh, and while being there, let's say midway through the through the courses through the through the university, um, I got hired or recruited to these research uh, uh, groups that are in the university, uh, like in the seed groups. And then then there I, I got I got exposed to the FEA. What is FEA? Um, how it is used? What are the applications? Uh, that was a while ago. And since then, yes, FEA has been growing and growing uh, ever more into my, my career uh, up to the point that today that is basically uh, all that I do for work. It's, uh, it's I would say 90% of my, of my job is FEA related at, at many levels, uh, since the most basic levels up to the, the, I would say the most advanced applications. Uh, we will talk today a little bit about fracture mechanics which I think is like the, one of the most important applications nowadays of, of, of FEA analysis. So uh, I like this uh, topic so much and, and the analysis and the design. I also studied a few things after the university on structural mechanics and, and design and, and, and these codes um, because um, I, I, as soon as I got out of the, I got out of the university I started working at the industry. I worked at a metal shop. I was the design engineer. So designing the structures and, and piping and supports and everything in steel, a lot of, a lot of things we did there. Machines, hydraulic machines, pneumatic machines. Um, and, and I really liked it. I really liked the applications and, and, and I decided that I wanted to be on the industry side, like on the practical application of, of, of these things. I really liked like this intersection between the knowledge and the, and the practical application. Um, that's that's what I decided that I wanted to to do. So when I got uh, from this job and you know, other jobs, I said, well, I, "That's what I want to do." You know, to work. And I started uh, looking for jobs in this area. And that's not easy in, in my country. There is not like a huge developed industry. And uh, I did so. I will. I will just do consulting. You know. I will just uh, go by myself. I register a company because the clients started to to ask uh, like for the, it's easier to always to contract with companies than with, than with persons. 
uh, I and then I registered this company and been doing that since then with a, a lot of uh, different people from industries, from companies, build builders and everything. They they need some design, they need some uh, analysis, FA analysis and, and the more advanced stuff that came up later. And that's what, I, that's what I've, been, I've been doing. So I've been applying uh, this idea of FEA and analysis and, and design uh, from stokers, from tanks and pipes and, and industrial equipment. Uh, and then that's what I've been, that's what I've been doing up to recently where, where I started uh, supporting the, the same skill product. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Uh, just as a context or for context for, for the listeners, which country are you from Guillermo? I'm in Colombia in, in South America. Yeah. So that uh, people know, because you talked about, it's very hard to get a job in FA in your country so that people can actually uh, know where you're from and what you're talking about. Uh, yes, yes, yes. So uh, here, um, most of the design and, and things are, are mostly, uh, imported, right? So if you need, uh, uh some equipment, equipment, you just buy it, uh, don't right uh, it's it's cheaper at, at least for us it's cheaper to, to, for people for the industry for the industry people to do it that way uh and that's how they do it that's so uh, engineering and, and design here it's not as, as prevalent as other countries where there are bigger industries uh for example there are uh products so commercial products uh they, they, it's not like a huge thing we import more of the most of the things here um, consumer products, uh, the development of such things uh, right now here is, it's not, uh, it's, it's not a huge industry, so it's not so easy to find jobs where, uh, this level of knowledge and this tech, these, uh, skills are, are required. There, there are, there are some of them, but it's, but it's, they are not really, like really easy to find as it is in other countries with better developed industries and, and in consumer products industries and that is where these things are, uh, are applied in, in a daily basis. I see. How did you actually delve into FEA in the first place? I mean, one question obviously could be Guillermo, why did you choose FEA and not CFD, for example, which is also super interesting. Like, was it intrinsically, like, was it like an intrinsic motivation to say, Hey, FEA is like maybe hard from a mathematical perspective. I like kind of the, as you said, intersection between theory and practical applications of FEA, like what sparked your interest? How did you actually get started studying FEA and how did you continue studying? Obviously learning about all the codes, applying it to real life, etc. Yeah. So, um, uh, I was kind of intro like presented, uh, to it at the university, as, as I said, in research groups. So I got hired in this research project, uh, done by the university for, for a company and, and there started doing, you know, research assistant tasks, <laughs> you know how it is. Um, but I, I, I really like this, uh, this practical application aspect of it. Right. Uh, perhaps if, if I, if I was, uh, exposed that early to CFD, maybe I, I, I would have gone into, into CFD, but it, it's just how the went. It, it came naturally to me. Mm -hmm. And, and there is this thing where, uh, this, I, I don't know if it happens only to me, but, uh, when you when these kind of topics, they come easily to you, like you understand it and, and it comes easily and, and you get the hang of it. That's attractive to me. Well, that's, that's like a, attractive, like, like get into it. It's like, you see the guitar behind. So you start, try, I want to learn guitar because I like music and everything. But then if, if, it, if you find out that it's easy to you, like it gets into you easy, like you have that talent somewhere inside you and it comes easy to you, then that's something attractive, uh, at, at least to me, uh, I don't know if it happens to, to everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, but, the, but the, the topics that we, that we covered, uh, from early, like the dynamics and, and the damage and, and, and the real analysis of, of what's actually happening and how, how can, the, the impact it can have on the design and, and on, on the systems. And that, that really liked me also, that, that attracted me a lot. Interesting. So it easily comes to you, but obviously FEA and other simulation methods, obviously are not that easy all the time. So at some point in your life, you obviously had some obstacles to overcome, for example, very difficult analysis. So the question is one of the principles of FEA is like divide and conquer. 
obviously. Now, the question is, how do you divide and conquer a problem in the first place? So you have a problem, FEA problem, you're a freelancer, Some, a company comes to you and says, hey, we have this problem, this task, can you solve it for us? How would, how would you approach uh, such a problem? So what I try to do always is to start uh, as simple as you can. Um, so you get this, this say, we call it a problem, so this test subject. You, you, you first identify uh, uh, what you need to model in order for to get realistic results. Right? So you say this, this has uh, these materials, this has uh, this thermal transfer, it has um, this, this, when I say material, I mean material properties, maybe lasting materials, maybe nonlinear materials, whatever they are. Uh, there are physical contacts, there are, there are transfers, uh, con transfer, heat transfer contacts. Um, and, and all of this stuff, uh, th these types of loads, so we have uh, big displacements, big deformation. So you, 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 you make this list of everything that is needed for the, for your, for your model to be realistic, everything that you need to take into account in your model and then start <laughs> stripping it down to the basics. Uh, so if you have, um, if you have many parts, so how many parts can I remove from there? So, so what, what I got, what I have left at the end, uh, is meaningful. I guess that that's a word it's meaningful. So start stripping everything down and, and you have, you, you will, you end up with a, with a model, with a, with a, with a subject that is, uh, that is very simple and hopefully easily to easy to implement. Uh, but it, it's still meaningful, even though it's not the, the most realistic, but it's meaningful. And when you get to that stage, uh, you have an initial results, uh, you start growing from there and then adding one by one, one by one. So if you have an assembly with bolts and, and these loads and hinges and everything, so how can I strip it down? So, Let's get rid of the bolts. Let's simplify them and replace them with other parts. We have these hinges constraints. So maybe I can uh, replace that with a with a bonded bonded contact. It's, maybe that's possible, mm -hmm. given that it, it won't rotate a lot. Uh, always start with linear simulation if possible, uh, and that 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 that's, that kind of simplifying and simplifying everything until you have, as I say, like the simple but meaningful model, and then you start adding from there. Uh, that, that, that's my divide and conquer. So I divide the, the problem into what are, what are the, 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 what is happening? What, what is the phenomena that is happening here that is causing the, that has an effect on the behavior? Because uh, at the end of the day, something that, uh, that you cannot lose from sight is that um, every simulation, every numerical model is a simplification. Of, of a real life phenomenon, right? So you, you always have to have in mind uh, what is the simplifications, where, where you are losing uh, uh, the realistic behavior, where, where you are deviating from the real life scenario. Um, and, and that's also a very important part of presenting the results to a client, right? So I always like to ground them, ground the client, say, okay, that, that's what we're going to do. And that's what you what, what you can expect from this, uh, because yeah, most of the time people is not really aware of, of all the, the the little details of of doing it. So th that's my divide and conquer strategy. I see. Obviously, a lot of people would probably talk or ask on the podcast um, for some practical applications. So let maybe like take, let's take one example and walk us through how would you do the pre processing? How would you approach that? Like from a very simplistic point of view then processing obviously, and then post-processing and also talk about the tools that you started using, because I feel that a lot of students, and I did that as well, start learning FA from the perspective that I choose, for example, Abacus, Ansys or whatever, for example, SimScale, and then they start fixating too much on the tool they are using and the capabilities it has, rather than taking the real life example, trying to divide and conquer, as you said, and actually understanding the problem rather than focusing too much on the tool, if you get what I mean. Maybe walk us through one example, how you would approach it. Tool agnostic, uh, basically. Yeah, maybe, uh, I don't know, what, what would you use uh, for, for an example? Hmm, yeah, yeah, it might be hard to, to comment. But as, as you said, um, yes, uh, so w w one aspect, one important aspect of, it's not that I'm dodging the question, sorry. 
is that uh, you mentioned something that is very important and it's about the tool and uh, yeah so what some some people think that uh knowing fea or cfd or any simulation is knowing a tool right so i'm comp competent in abacus or i'm competent in ansys or or in sim scale or, or, or any tool uh but that's just half of the half of the of the process right the, the, the and i would say that the most important part is to to what you say like the, the process of approaching the the modeling uh, even before you start implementing anything in, in any mm -hmm. tool, like like planning, like taking the time uh, to plan the model to all of these aspects that I, that I just mentioned, where the the physics that are that are related to it that will be relevant to have realistic results, and 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 then when you have a like a plan of action, then come to to whatever the tool you have at hand, because it also depends on. I don't know if it's only for for my reality that also on budget, right? So if you have access to ANSYS, which costs I don't know, a lot of money, or Abacus, which costs a lot of money, uh, maybe a tool that is more accessible, whatever tool you have, or maybe you don't have budget for a, for a tool and you have to go for, for the FEA solutions, uh, which are which are really good. We'll talk about it a little, in a little bit if, if you want to, um, but they are perfectly, it's perfectly fine to build, I guess, a business around uh, Coraster and Salome Meca or Open Foam, uh, which doesn't have, doesn't, they don't have a cost, uh, an upfront cost for, for the license. They have other costs, uh, but we can talk about it later. But then that, uh, about the practical example. So let's say you are tasked with analyzing a bike frame, for example. Say this bike company, uh, they have this new design of, of a frame mm -hmm. that they want to test. Uh, and they just gave you a cat with all the, with the complete value, you know, the wheels, uh, even the chain. And okay, so how do you approach that? Uh, we want to know the safety factors. Okay, so how did you approach that? Okay, so what, what I will do in that case is, okay, what, what is the most critical part? What, what is the part that, that you want to focus on? And they will probably tell you, no, we want to know about the frame, for example or the joints between the frame and, and the wheels, like the, the axis or uh, the axles or any the part they'll tell you, so you can focus on that. Okay, so uh, uh, you don't want to introduce such a big uh, model, complete complex with a lot of interactions between different parts. So if, if you can uh, somehow do a hand calculation, like a, uh, a rigid body uh, equivalent, like force balance and, and get some, some of the of the loads, say on the on the say you want to focus on the on the, the frame, okay. That's the first simplification. So I will focus on the frame. I will take all of all the other parts out and replace them with boundary conditions. So what type of boundary conditions the support on the on the axles bring to the case? Um, I will apply the load uh, on which part. So how is the load transmitted through the through the parts that I remove into the place where they contact? Say the handles. Maybe there is a uh, maybe there is a, an asymmetrical load they want to take into account, and then you apply a moment and a force uh, on the seat where the seat holds, and, and then take like take this part out and replace all of the interactions with the with the surrounding parts with boundary conditions. Uh, then you have okay, I have this model. So what is the material? So what is what is the material? What is it? It's a composite. Um, is it? Uh, what type of metal? Metal is it? Is it uh, more ductile? Is it more brittle? Uh, what is the expected uh, uh, work uh, regime? Say it will be linear all the time, mm -hmm. or am I analyzing uh, an extreme case where um, big damage is expected to the material? So will I be on the on the plastic range? So somehow maybe they are confident that uh, on the regular case uh, it would not fail, right? So we want to analyze a uh, worst case when would, like an impact, a big impact. Uh, what, would, what would be the damage to it? So okay, now we are dealing with nonlinear, uh, nonlinear behavior. Maybe now I have to study uh, the material curve. So how how this material behaves? Uh, does the client have have that data? or most of the time they will tell you that they don't have it. Uh, and and that, 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 that will be the approach. Like 
point by point. Is, is it is it the dynamical process important? Uh, is it or maybe uh, another another common case is uh, okay. So we are not under an impact like an extreme load, the regular load, but we want to know uh, what is the fatigue behavior. So what happens as this is uh, an off-road bike, for example, and you, we know that the that it will be vibrating a lot due, due to the bumps. So what is expected life or uh, at what in which region of the bike or of, of, of the structure is, is it most likely to crack or the crack will initiate, where, where will it break? And what is the expected life to it, uh, given this uh, rating of the of the weight, this maximum weight? How, how can we expect that? Um, then, if you're talking about fatigue, then there is a, another whole uh, set of data for the material that you need to collect or or simplify or, or model. And and then then after all this planning, uh, then I say I'm gonna perform these linear simulations under these loading conditions. I will perform this non-linear simulation under this loading condition. And for each one of them, I want to get these 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 results. So for this one, I want the bone mice's stress distribution. I want to find the higher stress. Uh, I want to identify where are the stress racers and maybe refine, do a little refinement or a big refinement and study around that, that point, that point. And, and, and try to estimate what is the higher stress, what is the higher, the big the peak stress or the stress amplitude uh, for the fatigue analysis and, and planning ahead. Then when, when you have a plan of action, implementing that into the tool uh, is first much easier because you have you have your goal in mind, and um, uh, and then you you can select the tool. Maybe that helps you to select the tool, because maybe uh, the the tool that you have at hand uh, doesn't have the feature to to perform what you need to do your your requirement, and then that can even help you to to select the tool. Definitely, yeah. It feels sometimes a bit like that you're a carpenter. So you have different types of screwdrivers. It doesn't really matter which one you use, but it's actually, if it solves the problem, it's the perfect tool. So depending on the case, you use the, you should use the specific tool with that SimScale answers, um, Comsol, for example. But yeah, you walked us through pre-processing, processing and post-processing. And there are a lot of students listening to this. These are basically the three essential steps for every simulation, like CFD, FEA. What do you take care of in pre-processing? Obviously, like defeaturing the CAD model, for example, we talked about that, but anything else, let us walk through pre-processing, processing and post-processing, and what we should take care of. For example, mesh independence, uh, parameter analysis, um, stress concentrations. How would you approach this? Maybe start with step one, which is already what I already mentioned, pre-processing. What is something you want to take care of? Yes, so in pre-processing, uh, talking about the geometry, so mm -hmm. you have a CAD model, and um, having in mind what you are going to do, what type of model, say, I'm going to do a shell model, for example, a shell or, or plate model, uh, as opposite to uh, a solid model, solid mm -hmm. model, or uh, uh, what, what is my des design strategy and um, what is my modeling strategy? So maybe some parts you can replace them with just pin elements and it will be good enough yeah. for, for that case. And then you are saving say, thousands of, of nodes and, and computational time. Uh, maybe you will use shells in some points, but maybe at some points you just need the solids. Um, and knowing uh, and here the experience helps a little bit uh, because uh, there are some pitfalls that you can fall into if uh, um, if you don't simplify enough, like small faces and some unnecessary fillets or places that need a fillet and, and the fillet is not there. For example, what happens with the welding with the weld be the weld beads, right? Mm -hmm. So um, most of the weld beads are not included in the, in CAT models, right? So you yeah. don't model that into CAT most, most of the time, most of the time. Or if you do it, then uh, uh, the CAT package has like a uh, just an indication that a weld is there, and it displays it on the on the 3D viewer like a weld, a really beautiful weld. But when you export the solid, it, there is no solid there. So th th these types of things uh, that you, you want to fall into and like remove a small faces and also remove like very sharp uh, ancient corners. Uh, that's also important. Or if you know that there will be a weld there, then somehow model uh, the weld and 
and have it in mind what you need for, for your analysis. It's not the same uh, to model for a linear analysis than for a nonlinear analysis or for a fracture mechanics analysis. Uh, it's, it's not the same model. So having that in mind is it's, it's, it's important. And the feature. So the simpler it can be, you can always add more complexity uh, if you need it uh, down the road. Uh, but having it at the beginning can complicate things a lot and, and make your make the work uh, harder. Interesting. So let's move on to processing. Obviously, there's a term called mesh independent study. That's something some people struggle with. Let's talk about mesh independent study and then other problems during processing. For example, you have a solver. You have a ton of solver settings. What do I actually use? Like, for example, my simulation doesn't converge. What do I do? But let's maybe start with mesh independence. How do you approach this personally? So uh, there are like uh, like basic uh, rules I would say that I will always follow when when doing meshing, and uh, the first one is that the the geometry has to be properly captured, right? It's it's no a mesh is no good if you ca if it cannot uh, capture a fillet. You know, it's uh, it has to capture all, all the features. That's the first thing you have to visually inspect that the mesh uh, looks like the real thing. Uh, that that maybe there are some parts that are not refined or, or that they, they, it doesn't look similarly, it won't behave the same if it doesn't, doesn't like really look like it. Then there are there are a few things, for example, uh, if you have a thin wall section like a wall and uh, you are uh, meshing it with, uh, this wall is under bending loads, say it's bending loads or it's tension mm -hmm. loads, um, then you say, okay, I always want to have at least uh, five nodes across the things. For example, or that uh, translates to if you are using a first order mesh, uh, that means you you have to have three elements across these things. For example, that's oh, a good you, forcing. That that's a good point. Can you explain why? Because I know when people listen to the podcast, they want to open a Google tab and see why do I need three nodes across my uh, my my uh, element? For so, example, yeah. So if you have a beam wall, beam, uh, you can think of it as a the classical beam theory, right? You have this beam and it's under bending and it bends. So mm -hmm. what is the what is the stress distribution? So it peaks to tension. Uh, well, if it's, if it's bending downwards, it peaks to compression at the top. Then it, do, it does, uh, like in classical theory, it does a, a linear variation. And then there is a peak in the with reversal of the stress on the other end, right? Yeah. So, uh, a finite element, a linear finite element, for example, can only have constant stress. Mm -hmm. So there is only one stress value in this element. That's what the, what, that's what the, the method does. Uh, and this variation that we see is by interpolating nerves. So if two elements connect at this node, at this node, then there is a constant value here. There is a constant value here. And the value in the node is just averaging. Mm -hmm. That's what, that's the, the, the average results that we see in mass pass processor. So uh, what happens is that you have this variation, this distribution that goes from negative maximum value to a positive maximum value and goes through zero. And if you have only one element, how do you capture that? If you are lucky, you will get zero value, right? Just the mm -hmm. constant value. And that's completely wrong results. You are really far, far away from reality because you won't see the, the, the inversion of the stresses due to, to this bending load, right? So if you have two elements, uh, what happens is that you have this constant value here that is uh, hopefully is like the mean value of the stress, the, sorry, the, the compression portion, and you have the mean value of the, of the tension portion of the distribution. Yeah. And that is, that is not good. <laughs> it's, it's still not, 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 not a good approximation of what is actually happening. So you want to have more elements, and I will say that if you are using linear, at least you want three. Uh, I will go with four, and for depending on the situation, if you really need that stress distribution, then you need much more, more nodes. Like I would say, let's take six elements, seven nodes, or eight nodes, or ten nodes, so depending on the, because then the you don't have like the ideal uh, beam under just one bending action, right? Then you have bending moments in the three directions. And you also have tensions and compressions. And what it does is modify that distribution. And it's no longer like this straight line uh, with inversion, but you will, you can have like a really complex uh, 
really complex uh, distributions across the thickness. And you need more nodes to capture that. Otherwise, it's, it, it's not captured. It's not possible for the solver to capture that if you don't, if you don't add more, more nodes. Or you can also increase the, the order of magnitude. So when you have a second order element, what is that? Now we don't have like a, a, an element with constant stress. Now we can have like a linear variation. So it captures better this real life distribution. Uh, so it, it, it is another approach, uh, increasing Definitely. the mesh. Yeah, so what, what you want to do, so, so, sorry, what you want to do with the mesh independence is okay. Um, I have this initial distribution. Uh, I want to see if I can, if I need to improve my mesh. Improve my mesh is just throwing more nodes at it. So mm. this, it, so let's try again. With what happens if I add another, another element, another node here, another element? How does the the new distribution looks like, right? Uh, does it vary too much? And then maybe you, you find that it that's actually, it, it's very different. So let's do it again. Let's add another one and see how it varies until you get on a point where it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really change too much, or you have to do another types of analysis because when, when you're dealing with the stress racers, stress concentrators, mm -hmm. then that's another topic because actually the, the stress is infinite there. Right, mm -hmm. uh, theoretically, so uh, stress that is increasing is actually approaching the reality. But that, so, that, that's a little bit more of a different. How do you approach this in general, Guillermo? Because that's what I actually wanted to talk about next. If you do mesh independent study, and that's what the name comes from, mesh, mesh convergence. So you would see kind of a converging curve if you plot, plot on the x-axis degrees of freedom, then for example, the von Mises stress on the y-axis. But then what if it doesn't converge? Let's give some practical tips to, to people out there. What do you do? Okay, so my my mentor says that it has to converge, right? <laughs> That's what he says to me. So when you are working with a say a, a, an engineer that is uh, that is senior that has more experience on VA, and you tell him it's not converging, it's not converging. I have <laughs> I have from five meshes at it, and it's not converging. And then he he says to you, it has to converge somehow. So just do it. <laughs> that, that that's what happens, right? And, and you are under this pressure because you have a deadline to deliver. And it's not converging, right? So you, the uh, you have to take really, really have a look at what is happening there, right? So uh, most likely it's a corner, for example, mm -hmm. an entrant corner, and there is a stress concentrator there, and it's, it, it doesn't convert. Uh, well, one technique that I that I learned is. Um, is to, well, that, that, that's in the case that you have like an interface between two materials. So for example, when you have a weld bit uh, there, or you have a change to a, to a software material or to mm -hmm. a harder material. So what they have identified the researchers is that there are some regions and that you can, uh, you can ex actually extrapolate it. So uh, you can like a draw a line approaching the singularity, right? So this, you have this corner, and then you have the stress racer here, right? You can draw a line and measure the stress in the uh, uh, as you approach the stress concentrator. So what you will see is that the stress is rising linearly, then it does a parabola, and then it goes up. Mm -hmm. But when you start refining, the first region doesn't change. And the second region change uh, less. And the third region is the region that, that explodes as you as you add more and more or not. You can extrapolate the stress there. <laughs> That's one technique. Uh, you can just continue the the straight portion up until the point where the stress racer is and get that as a significant stress value. Because uh, all the, uh, actually, uh, do you see more of this on the on linear simulations, right? So linear materials, and and what happens with with linear materials is that they uh, theoretically the capability of have infinite stress. In real life, you it won't happen, right? In real life, you you will have yielding, for example, and yield looks like it goes up and you get a straight line because the stress gets redistributed to the okay. to the to the sides. Uh, that's something that you can do. It's it's a stress racer, but you won't actually see uh, really higher stresses, really high above yield, 
What happens is that the part softens and then the load use, like the energy put from the load gets, gets distributed in the local region and you get a local yielding region. That's another thing that, that you can do. Maybe include that consideration into your linear analysis or move to a nonlinear analysis and see actually what is happening. If you see that it's, it's actually not converging, but, uh, Throwing more nodes at it, it's, you always have to do it uh, until you decide that you need, okay, we need, I need to like step back and look at what is actually happening in this region and why, why is it happening, but it should always converge. Mm -hmm. So having a look at uh, what you just told us is basically interpreting the numbers, the number crunching that happens behind the scenes in form of legends, which is like brings us to post-processing. Do you have like practical tips for people doing FEA? what to take care of, how to do sanity checks, and how to do post-processing in general? Um, yes, yeah, so one, one very common technique is to look at it, uh, have a, to know what, what you are actually looking at. So, <laughs> so if you, um, say for example, you, you are looking at uh, the pretty pictures, you know, the, the, average, the average results at, at the node, uh, compare it to the to the to this to the element solutions, right? So when when you have a look at the element solutions, you will see that each element has this constant or linearly varying stresses, for example, and and that, that can help you see if there are like if there are huge jumps across across two adjacent elements, then there is a problem there, and you need to to refine the mesh. Maybe the mesh is not fine enough that. That helps a lot. And also having in mind what, what you want to do. So uh, uh, having things that, that, that are realistic is, is important, like to evaluate, is, is this result realistic? So what is happening there? If you are, for example, on their, on their nonlinear analysis, so this physical contact, is it interpenetrating, uh, for example, uh, that voids the results or um, is this boundary condition behaving as expected? So if you allow some rotation uh, around some axis, is that, does it reflect the, what I wanted? Because remember that we started from, from a plan and we know more or less what we want. So ha looking at the results and looking at what, what you expected to have. So is it, is it actually behaving as I expected that it, to behave in terms of, is it deforming the way it needs to form or uh, where are the stress racers? So for example, if you, uh, something that I do a lot is economy of the mesh. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, in a part that has multiple places, multiple the stress racers, you cannot refine it at every one of them at the same time. Right. Uh, you say you focus on one portion, then focus on that portion. Uh, and try to identify other parts. Maybe you do another mesh independence studies for this other, for this other region. And, and, and focusing on your plan, like uh, if you can plan ahead what results you want to have, and more or less how do you expect that to, to to come out? Uh, that's important to look at in post processing. Something that I uh, I like to do, for example, to some tips, um, I always like to clip the color ranges to a minimum value and a maximum value. Say, I try to put my, say, allowable stress on the maximum range. Then I can easily see on thread uh, what are the part, what are the, the regions that are above this this value that are, what are the problematic regions? That helps me a lot like, to do this. Or maybe you can do like a volume clips, uh, like ISO volume yeah. visualizations and, and then put on the minimum this allowable stress, and that will just show you what are the parts, the, the elements that are above the value. That, that, those are good tips. So this could be so essential that, that I do. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Cool. We'll leave it at that. And what is your actual job then at SimScale? Is it actually helping people or customers doing exactly that? Like looking at their results and kind of seeing are they doing the right thing? Do I need to support them in any kind, in any way? Yes. Would... So, so at SimScale, uh, I have two types of clients. So one is actually seems skill <laughs> and one is the, the, the users of the platform. So I have in, in both cases. Um, so 
of course, that uh, for the user, sometimes uh, the cases are simpler because, uh, yeah, some people uh, are starting to learn simulation, they use SimSkill, they don't have this. And, and I help them with, with all of this. So um, how to approach the modeling for the case, for example, how to do it and how to implement that in the, in the tool, of course. So how do I define my material? How do I... Uh, implement this boundary condition, or I have this condition here. What would be the best case? And and of course the uh, the trouble solving, right? So this simulation doesn't run, and I don't know why. Please find out why why it doesn't work, uh, and how to make it work. That's also a, uh, an important or a re relevant part of my day day to day mm -hmm. job here. So supporting supporting customers and supporting also the, the internal. Engineers, of course, the, the internal engineers, they bring me the, the, the most, most complex problems. So really yeah. uh, models with a lot of nonlinearities. So material nonlinearities and, and physical contacts and, and all of, all of that different stuff that, that makes the problems harder. That's, that's mostly what I, what I deal with. I see. Interesting. I feel that the dog always barks in the background whenever we talk about uh, meshes or like results. So I think he's, not, he's not abused about FAA as well. So, um, yeah, yeah, he does actually... have some trauma with simulation. <laughs> Probably. Maybe his owner is also an FAA guy. Who knows? Um, we also talked about, like, actually, this is how we met Guillermo, I think, right? Via the forum, the SimScat forum, a couple of years back. I think it was must have been four or five years now, maybe even six. Yes. I don't know. This is how we yeah. met. And then the rest is history, which is really cool. But yeah. Um, also, when it comes to, we talked about these re-entrant corners, which brings us to the point of cracks, which is also when we talk about singularities, all these kind of things, and then there comes extended finite element method and J integral and whatnot. Can you maybe give us a, a, maybe a primer to fracture mechanics? What is it in the first place? How do you approach it? What are the pitfalls? Okay, yeah, sure. So in, in a nutshell, uh, what happens uh, every time that I talk, I like to bring up this is say food of stuff. So if you measure, if you measure the stress that you need to apply to, to a material, say at the molecular level to break, to break the, the, the atomic bond. Uh, and you can measure that in the lab. There is, there is this data. You have like a, a stress value that is really high. So really high, but when you test a material, uh, to the breakpoint, and you measure that stress that you applied, this stress value is very or much, much lower than the, 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 the stress needed to break the actual atomic bond, or the, the bond at the molecular level. So what is happening there? So what, what is happening? What is that? Uh, uh, what is that? And if you uh, compare this test subject, one that is very polished, very, very polished. And maybe one that has a, a little defect in there, like a crack, like a little crack. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the one with the crack uh, breaks at a much, much lower stress level. And you might think, oh, okay, is that uh, you reduce the area? Because if you have like this, you, you look at the cross-sectional area and and okay, you, well, the, what the crack does is to reduce the cross-sectional area, right? Those the stress is higher. But if you actually take into account that reduction of the of the cross-sectional area, uh, and you compute the stress, then this stress is, is it, it doesn't add up. So mm -hmm. it, 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 the stress level on the reduced area it still is not on the on the on the stress level needed to break like the the pristine or the smooth part. So something is happening there. There is some phenomena that uh, that is not explained simply by, by by this test, and that's where the topic of a stress concentration arises. So the the effect of having this this little notch or this little crack is that uh, there is a stress concentrator there, and the stress starts to go up or, or go the way up to infinity when you are at the base of of this crack. That that is what is actually actually happening. People started to to study on that. that they model uh, analytically what are the stress distribution around the crack and everything, and they came up with the uh, with this say new failure mode. 
it, it's not a new failure mode, but they identify this new theory of failure mode. They identify that the stress distribution is characterized by, by one parameter, and they call it the stress concentration, the stress intensification factor, uh, K. K mm -hmm. is, the, is, the, yeah. the, is the letter to identify it. This K depends on the applied stress, but it depends also on the geometry of the crack. So you have the applied stress and the geometry on the crack, uh, and then it gives you this parameter, which you can actually compare to a material property, uh, aching or parallel to as you uh, compare a stress state to a uh, uh, gel stress or, or a safety stress, then you have uh, this, this state, which is the stress intensity factor, which you can compare to a mate actual material property. And this gives you a, a new failure mode that you want to analyze in the case when you have the crack. And, and the interesting part is that, uh, as I mentioned, it depends not only on the applied stress, but also on the on the on the on the geometry of the of the crack of, of the defect that the that the part has. So if you keep the stress constant, but for constant, but for example, you make the crack a crack that is deeper into the material, the stress intensity factor uh, increases, and then you are on the uh, a condition that is that is less safe. You know, you're reducing your safety factor against this property. Which, by the way, is the material toughness, the fracture toughness, is how they call it. So it's it's the it's the resistance of the the capacity of the material to resist against this growth of this crack. That's and when when you're a stress intensity factor, maybe because you increase the stress, or maybe because the the crack is too deep into the material. It, when it when it goes above this value, this fracture toughness value, then the crack just grows. Uh, on, in, in an unstable manner, and the crack really goes. The part can break a lot. I see. So that, 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 that's basically what fracture mechanics is. So we are we are used to the the uh, uh, strength of materials approach, which is compare stresses with with safe stresses, with gel stress, with ultimate stress. But now we have another, I'll say, another avenue to assess the face, the safety of, of the parts in the case when we have a crack in it, which is the stress intensity factors and the material toughness. That's, that's what fracture mechanics tries to do. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And I think the, the way it's introduced in universities always, it's in called in German, it's LEBM. So it's linear elastic uh, fracture mechanics. This is how it's, I think it's introduced first, but obviously there's also a uh, nonlinear fracture mechanics, things like that. So maybe let's start very simple because I have a ton of questions. <laughs> So when mm -hmm. you have a FEA software, for example, which deals with extended finite element method, short X, XFEM, okay. how does, how does the solver actually know how the crack propagates and what do you take care of when doing such, such an analysis in the first place? Okay. So, uh, crack propagation is, um, so in, in fracture mechanics, in all the topics of fracture mechanics, there are different, different, say topics of a star, subtopics of a star. Mm -hmm. So one of them is, as you mentioned, the linear fracture mechanics. So what are the stress intensity factors, uh, how we compute them and everything. Uh, assuming, assuming that we are under a linear region, right? So the material is linear elastic. Uh, there is no, there is no plasticity happening like in the, in a really big portion of the, of, of the part. Mm -hmm. uh, then there is non-linear. So what happens if we consider the, the, the plasticity or the yielding phenomena around the crack? Because there is always yielding around the crack. Yeah. Uh, there is always, there is always a plastic zone at the, at the, at the bottom of the crack. There is always there. Uh, and there is another topic that is crack growth. So, uh, when, uh, crack growth, um, uh, and this is also a, a really beautiful part of it is that, uh, crack growth, um, can be, uh, say two in due to two, re two reasons. So one is that the stress intensity factor is really high. Mm -hmm. Uh, that you are approaching the fracture toughness and then the cracks has to grow because the material cannot withstand that anymore. It, it, it breaks. But the other one, which is uh, fatigue, fracture growth, right? So uh, it means that you apply uh, an alternating stress intensity factor to the part. And even though the highest value of that, uh, of, of that, distribution, that variation that you're applying, it's not close to the fracture toughness, so you are safe, say in the static, in the static case, you are safe and you feel that you're safe because your maximum stress intensity factor is, is not close to the, 
uh, to the fracture toughness of the material. But the action of of applying this repeated process, uh, it makes the fracture grow, even though you are safe on it. That, that that's some beautiful uh, result that is uh, parallel to what we see in, when, for example, when we study fatigue. You say the same. Okay, mm -hmm. my stress level is well below my static failure criteria, but then the part fails. So it's that because the repetition of the load makes the the material get get uh, fatigued, yeah. get tired of with sending the load, and then it takes the luggage and gets away. I'm out of here. I'm tired of, of handling your loads for you, mm. so I'm out. Of here. <laughs> That's what the material does, and it happens the same with the fracture mechanics. Uh, so. What the solver does, there are many theories. This is, a, I would say, a relatively new field of knowledge. There are many tests and theories being developed. Uh, so uh, there are theories that may be hard to get into them right here. But what it does, it, it takes the distribution of the stress intensity factors at the bottom of the crack. And um, it assumes that, OK, how are we going to grow? And then we have some theories that say, uh, that and at what direction it will grow. So it's it's related to the to the maxim, ma, maximization of the of in, in what direction if the fracture grows, in what direction I will I will get as let's say a, an energy balance that you know that that type of, of, of reasoning. Mm -hmm. And that's how that's how it says okay I'm gonna grow in that direction to that angle because that angle minimizes some function that would make create a balance that like the, the least energy state and it, that will lead me there, then it it applies this. And then there are some uh, some theories about how how that some theories about where does it grow to. Uh, in real life, um, in real life, that's not actually how we say in the industrial applications. That's not how to, actually how we how we apply the stress growth. Uh, because it's it's not really practical. Uh, we use uh, what is done, and when I say we, I mean <laughs> we have some codes uh, that 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 regulates how to actually implement these analysis types. Um, and what is done is uh, use something that is called the Paris law. So mm -hmm. the Paris law relates uh, the amplitude of the applied stress intensity factor to the growth of the of the crack. And what we do is uh, count the number of cycles. So you assume a crack growth, say, uh, I will say it will grow to 0 0.1 millimeter. And then I use this law to, uh, to count how many cycles I needed to get there. And I save that. Then I grow again, and I save that. I go again, and I save that. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's uh, until you can estimate how many cycles you need until the part fails, until you reach your, your failure criteria. And you say, okay, uh, I counted that many cycles, like that many thousand cycles. And given your, your operation regime, uh, I think that will happen in one year, in two years, or in six months. And so please be aware of your part. Yeah. So inspect it and, and, and be prepared to get it off of, of stop the operation uh, to replace this part for example that's what is actually what we do on, on consulting for the for the industry for real i parts. see i see that's super interesting guillermo so i'm not sure i'm not an expert obviously in crack walls and fracture mechanics but the paris law that you mentioned is, is super beautiful because actually with hand calculation you can kind of calculate put in the cycles the geometry of the crack which is taken into account and then you have the regions of no crack growth because if people look up paris law it's kind of a when you put a lot of logarithmically it's like a curve mm -hmm. and it flattens a bit and then goes to instable crack growth. Like when you look at the codes, when is a crack not acceptable anymore? When it reaches this instable crack growth region of the Paris law or? Um, yes, basically, yes. Okay. I mean, uh, but the thing with, uh, with real life application is that we don't separate this uh, strength of materials approach and the fracture mechanics approach, but we deal with them uh, at the same time. So if you have a look at uh, what is called, this methodology is called the, the failure assessment diagram. Mm -hmm. So you plot on your, on your horizontal axis, what is the safety factor against a stress failure? So you have a, a safety factor of stress, and then you plot on the vertical axis, 
I will do it this, this side. You plot on the vertical axis, your safety factor against uh, fracture toughness failure. So, and then you draw this region, which is not a square. It's, it's this region uh, that tells you, okay, you have an operating point. And if it moves horizontally, it means that uh, the stress is increasing, then you can expect a failure due to stress to yielding of the part. But if it, if it goes up, then the stress intensity factor is increasing, and uh, then you can expect like the sudden growth. But in, in real life, it doesn't go either of these ways. It goes some curves and things because it depends on the thickness of the part, depends on the, the crack, the, 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 if the crack is, is longer or is shorter, is steeper, the shape of the crack, if it's an ellipse, if it's square, or, or if it's on an edge, the, all, all of that geometry of that, then this, you, you see this curve growing and getting closer and closer to, the, to this failure region, this limit of failure region. And that's what, uh, how we actually assess that because we cannot, uh, if the crack is grow, the crack is growing, you may get to, to an state where the remaining thickness of material cannot withstand the, the load anymore. And you get like a high yield in there. Uh, and, and in that case, maybe you didn't reach uh, the fracture toughness, even though the, the, the crack is really deep into the material that may happen. It. Uh, or it may happen that, that the stress is really low, but then under this condition, the fracture thugness is really high and you expect that the crack to grow suddenly. Uh, and th that's how we assess that. I see. When it comes to meshing itself, is it always that you mesh finer around the crack? Is it like a rule of thumb or is there like special techniques for meshing in XFAM? Yes, there, there are special techniques to mesh around the crack. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have seen some programs that can compute... Uh, for example, I have seen really rough meshes in ANSYS uh, mm -hmm. to, to compute, uh, and they are supposed to work, but I don't, I'm not sure uh, if it works for nonlinear uh, fracture uh, mechanics. Mm -hmm. For linear fracture mechanics, I think that a very rough mesh uh, works around the crack. Uh, the integration is okay. But for a nonlinear case, uh, um, uh, at least the codes that I work with, they even show you how the mesh should look like. So you want a really fine mesh of hexahedral hexahedrals uh, around the bottom of the crack. That's mm -hmm. what you want. And even at the at the crack, at the at the very tip of the crack, uh, there are special elements that are basically you take this square element and then you take the top nodes and you collapse them together yeah. to coincide on the bottom of the and that creates uh, that cre as the length goes to zero, that creates an actual singularity there. Got it. That's Very interesting. That, that is also used. Uh, of course, the, the stress at this point is never realistic because in theory it's infinite, right? Mm. So you, you start always measuring from the second node below okay. that. Okay, interesting. Also, it also it's, it's also related to uh, the technique that is numerically used to compute the stress intensity factors. So there are, there are different techniques uh, and depending on the technique, you might also need a specialized mesh to deal with the techniques. You mentioned the J integrals. So the J integral can be done uh, with a path, like a, a, a path, uh, a curve path mm -hmm. uh, around the crack. And where you put this path, uh, in theory, or in reality, it's, it's the, the result is independent of, the, say, the radius of this path. Even um, as, as long as it goes all the way around the crack, it doesn't matter if you put it around the, the, the only one node or if you, say, do it around the second node or the third, the, third, the third lines of nodes. It's independent to that. And there are some extensions to that technique. So, for example, I have done a lot of work with a coraster, and coraster does not perform a, J in, a path integral, but it does what they call this theta method, where they, instead of the, of the path, they create a ring around the path. Mm -hmm. Then they take more nodes into account, and that's that's the that's the methodology that they used, and I validated it <laughs> back then, and it, it, it works. It gets the same. But then there are there, there are other other types of techniques that are not the path in the, so the integrals around, for example, measuring the crack opening, the crack tip opening. There there are other methodologies that that are accepted, uh, but I, I think the important part here 
is uh, yeah, to always be rooted and, and, and know what you're doing and just read uh, what is happening here. What is the theory behind it? What are the, the important aspects of it? If you are dealing with a code, as I do for, say, for consulting in this area, uh, so what are the accepted methods there? What are the accepted measures there? Uh, look at similar uh, similar works and, and how, you know, just, just, just to be sure, just to be sure. Not, don't be too adventurous if there is responsibility on, on, on the results of this, of this solution. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Cool. All right. Um, there's also, do we miss something in terms of post-processing? Do you need special post-processing techniques? Yes. So the, the first one is the computation of the stress intensity factors, uh, from the, from the FEA simulation, uh, just go to the manual of the, of the tool you are using and see what are the considerations, uh, if, uh, what are the recommended measures to use the, the, the actual modeling, the actual methodology that they implement. Uh, that that's that's very important, and always perform mesh independent. So always refine around the, the 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 bottom of the crack and see how how this distribution changes. Interesting, cool. And I think if you can scripting skills uh, don't hurt. So if you can script, that's always useful. I think what you want to do is repetitive tasks as an FEA engineer. You want to script them maybe in Python, MATLAB, or any other tool that you're using or programming language. Um, you also have experience in that, I know, Guillermo, maybe you talk yes. about scripting in general, how it can help FEA engineers. Yes, yes. So, for example, uh, these meshes are on the cracks. Uh, I'll say, let's say the example that I have done with Coraster in Salome Meca. Mm -hmm. We need a very specific mesh to have good results of these quantities. And uh, doing these meshes, is, is, it takes time. So, what I do, what I did... For example, I participated in this uh, in this project, which is um, this company here. They operate uh, pipelines, oil pipelines, mm -hmm. uh, and in, in their main, main maintenance uh, their maintenance tasks, uh, they are they wanted to implement like the fracture mechanics analysis of the cracks that, that they found on, when, when they inspections and say all of that. So I knew that I'm go I was going to deal with a lot of pipes, right? Uh, so what I did is I went to Salome Meca and I did the first one, the second one, until I was uh, I was confident on my methodology, on my meshes, on how I model it, and created a script out of that. Uh, this particular tool, Salome Meca, it allows you to dump like all your operations from geometry and meshing to a, a to a, a Python script, which you can then take and identify where are the parameters like the diameters, what are the thicknesses and and the crack uh, the crack lengths and then replace the numerical values with variables. And then you have a script that you can just uh, introduce the parameters and it will give you the mesh ready for simulation. For to create in the groups, all of these time consuming tasks, not only modeling, but also the mesh refinements, what are the number of elements, or what are the mesh groups that I need uh, for this analysis where I apply my pressure, where are my symmetry planes, and all of that things that can take you a few hours up to a few days to do, you can automate all of that. And that, that's really helpful when you know that you will do this repetitive task. Cool. Sounds cool, Guillermo. Any, any last comments, maybe to wrap it up? I see we have gone over one hour already. I thought it was like half an hour. <laughs> But maybe any last yeah, closing right. remarks for FEA um, people who want to delve into FEA or maybe become specialists like yourself. Any last tips? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really feel, and I will say this, is that uh, you cannot uh, separate or split apart like the theory and the and the reasonings behind the method from the actual implementation. So sometimes people tend uh, to believe that just learning how to operate a software, ANSI, Sabacus, console, SimScale, it's enough to perform analysis, but um, I would say that keep always in mind that the analysis starts much, much earlier than touching the tool. So take your time to, to understand what is happening, what the method is doing, and that allows you to plan ahead uh, your modeling approach. Even with experience, you will be able to identify uh, 
the pitfalls that would appear. You can see it. it you, you can even sometimes say, okay, I'm going to run the simulation and I expect it to fail due to this. And then you know that you are in control of it. And that, that I, I guess that what uh, I don't feel like I am an expert or, or something like that. I always need, uh, have new things to learn, but, um, uh, when I can even foresee the failures in, in a model, then I feel that I am in control. And I, I, I guess that's what you want when you are doing anything like this, to feel that you are in control of the tool, in control of the method, in control of, of what you're doing. Uh, you know, you can, what, what outcomes you can expect from it. And if you can foresee that, then you're, I guess you are on a good track to, to be able to tackle any new problems that that people throw at you and then cool. that, that that was it yeah that makes sense um of course guillermo if you provide me with any links any resources i'll put them down in the description so that people can follow you on linkedin reach out to you and also have a look at fea resources talking about fea resources which is your favorite book or course that you have taken in the past in fea uh i would say that actually oh it's been a long time i started with the classical books you know the ready ones Mm -hmm. what you learn the basics uh maybe i for have forgotten i have taken courses uh but most recently say in the recent years say five years back to that uh when when i was learning this fracture mechanics topic i think that uh this code it's, it's not actually a book it, it's a code but it's written in such a nice way that it looks like a book because it gets you through all the process of how to do a stuff and then it gives you even the links to the actual books and the research in the papers. Mm -hmm. And that, that one is the API, API, like in the, like in programming APIs, but it's the, the Petroleum Institute, uh, in America, um, 579. It's also ask me fitness for service code. Uh, I see. That code is not so long. If so, if you want to get a sense of what practical application of SEA looks like nowadays, I would say have a look at that at that code because for me it's an amazing code. It's amazing. It, it's not only for fracture mechanics. It started there, but then it goes. They, they extended it. It goes all the way uh, of stress analysis, um, uh, finite elements analysis, materials modeling, uh, failure modes, fatigue, and all many other stuff like like, like creeping failures and a, a lot of that. But the way they co they go through it, it I, I feel that it's really nice. So. If I if I would recommend some something to read to someone that wants to get really practical with FE applications, go to that code. Uh, I think you will learn a few things from there. Cool, sounds good. I think I'll put the link down in the description for sure. You send it to me via email, Guillermo, and then I'll pack as many links as I can in the description and pin it in the comments. Cool. That was really also a humbling experience to have you on the podcast because it always shows me when guests are on my show how much I actually don't know. So that's very humbling. So there's still a lot to learn in terms of FEA, even though you consider yourself a beginner, intermediate or expert, whatever it might be. But yeah, thank you so much, Guillermo. And I hope to see you in the SimScale office in Munich at some point. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for, for having me. Uh, I mean, you have had so amazing people here in this podcast, you know, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and, and FEA teachers and very expert people. It's, it's, uh, it's really, uh, I'm really flattered that, that, that I can share my thoughts and, and my experience on on the topic, I would consider myself an expert. So I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy that uh, you wanted to have me here, and, and I hope that what we talk can, can, can help, can help people that want to learn, that want to get into the, into, into the, into the techniques, into this area. And, and yeah, thank you so much. And I also hope to, to see you, to see you soon, maybe okay. in the offices in Munich. Cool, Guillermo. Thank you so much. Take care and have a nice day. Bye.